Thank you very much, Suzanne. Um, is, the, um, is this sound all right? Is that okay for everybody? Thank you for coming. Um, it's, I'm going to open by saying it's strange, isn't it, to think that as we gather in this distinguished and internationally known institution, well known for the excellence of its higher education and its research, that at its beginnings, nearly 190 years ago, it was treated widely as a joke. Plans for the University of London were also viewed with suspicion. The new institution seemed to represent a danger to the social and political status quo to a Tory government, faced with agitation for reforms, which were finally brought in by a Whig government in the Great Reform Act of 1832. Many of the founders and supporters of this new institution um, were reforming Whig and radical members of parliament, and therefore, it's not surprising, perhaps, that from the start, this institution was the object of press attention, much of it hostile. I'm going to start with um, an article in The Times in June 1825. It's an article entitled The London College. And it gives an account of a meeting at the Crown and Anchor Tavern on the Strand the previous Saturday of, as the Times says, about 120 of the gentlemen who have taken a principal interest in the formation of the London College or University. In the chair at the meeting was Henry Broom, prominent Whig lawyer and politician, of which quite a lot more later, or of whom quite a lot more later. Supporting Broom were several other reforming members of Parliament, including Lord John Russell, third son of the Duke of Bedford of this parish. And Joseph Hume, founder, famous for his dogged attacks on royal and aristocratic profligacy, and in particular on the shenanigans in the, with the Navy budget. Also there was Dr. George Birkbeck, founder of the London Mechanics Institution in 1823, and at the foot of the table was the poet Thomas Campbell. All those present were agreed, the Times reported, on the necessity of establishing for the great population of this metropolis a college which would comprehend all the leading advantages of the two great universities, while allowing students to remain at home with their parents, thus catering for their domestic supervision, and offering a cheaper education than could be had at the ancient residential universities of Oxford and Cambridge. Broom announced at the meeting that he had sounded out various cabinet members about the possibility of applying for a royal charter to establish the new university, but had been discouraged. He was now in the process of putting a private bill to the House of Commons, explaining to his fellow MPs that there was no intention at present of conferring degrees. Though students wouldn't be able at first to take degrees in the new institution, this was a concession to the vested interests of Oxford and Cambridge, which Broome saw as an unfortunate necessity for the time being. Though they wouldn't be able to take degrees, they would be offered a full higher degree syllabus. The founders' most radical and contentious step was to exclude theological teaching. The syllabus would be much expanded to include, in addition to the traditional subjects of mathematics and classics and philosophy, they would include science, literature, and the arts. There would be no religious tests, such as those operating at Oxford and Cambridge, where students were obliged to sign the 39 articles of the Church of England in order to take their degrees, and where all teaching fellows had to do likewise. At the new university, there was to be, I'm still quoting from the Times account of the meeting, no barrier to the education of any sect among His Majesty's subjects. Medical studies were envisaged, and London students would have the advantage over their peers at Oxbridge, though this was diplomatically left by Broome to be inferred. They'd have the advantage of combining the academic study of anatomy and physiology at the university with attending practical medical classes at one of the London hospitals. If you studied medicine at Oxford and Cambridge at this time, you would have to come up to London at some point um, to attend one of the teaching hospitals here. So clearly, a new university in London would be able to take advantage of the already existing teaching hospitals. Treading thus warily to avoid stepping on the toes of the two ancient institutions, which would be unlikely to welcome a London rival, Broome described how the money would be raised for this new institution. 
The capital, he said, intended for the undertaking was estimated at £200,000 and the mode of raising it by transferable shares of £100 each. Well, the Times, which was friendly to Broom and friendly to the university, continued to report the doings of this fledgling institution in some detail. From its conception in 1825 to the opening of the new building on Gower Street to welcome the first in intake of students in October 1828. The Times had been the chosen vehicle for the very first public suggestion of a university for London as early as February 1825, when it carried a long, diffuse, open letter from Thomas Campbell to Henry Broom entitled Proposal of a Metropolitan University. Now, though Campbell didn't put the case as succinctly as his colleagues would have wished in this letter, it's apparent that the aim of the planned university was fourfold. One, to offer higher education in the politically and financially most important city in the world, and thus remove the ignominy of London having, unlike Paris and many other European cities, no university. Two, to educate the sons sons only, I'm afraid, at this date, are of the expanding middle class. Three, to welcome non-Anglicans of every kind by avoiding the religious tests which had hitherto prevented them from graduating from English universities. And four, to enlarge the curriculum beyond the traditional classical, mathematical and theological education offered at Oxford and Cambridge. The radicalism of the proposal did not go as far as to include higher education for women at this point, though when women were finally permitted to take degrees in 1878, it was at University College London that the innovation was introduced. One particular attraction for parents stressed by Campbell in his letter to the Times was the relative cheapness of keeping their sons at home instead of sending them away to live in a college. He writes, say a man has a thousand pounds a year, he can hardly send one son to an English university. To send three sons would cost him at least 750. Each son kept at home in London, on the other hand, would cost about 25 to 30 pounds for his education, with perhaps clothing and pocket money amounting to another 25. Not wishing to alienate the two ancient universities too much, Campbell does not state explicitly the further advantages of parents, of, to parents of being able to keep a close eye on their offspring and so to thwart the well-known propensity of young men at university to run up wine and tailoring bills, not to mention such costly and tempting pursuits as gambling and resort to prostitutes. In the end, once the university had been launched, and the dust settled on the controversy it aroused, the two aims which were to prove truly important and influential for the education and culture, not just of London, but of the whole country, were the opening of higher education to people of all faiths and none, and the expansion of the curriculum. The University of London, which changed its name to University College London in 1836, when it was finally given degree awarding status, the university was the first to include a range of subjects not taught before, including several branches of science and medicine, geography, architecture, modern history, English language and literature, and other modern languages and literatures, including French, German, Spanish, Italian, and Hebrew. These progressive aims were vigorously opposed by newspapers supporting the Tory government and defending the special position of the Church of England. None entered the lists more combatively than John Bull, the newspaper founded in 1820 to support the unpopular George IV in his efforts to keep his estranged wife Caroline from attending his coronation as queen. Broom had made an eternal enemy of George IV by acting as Caroline's legal advisor in that matter. John Bull immediately seized on Campbell's letter in the Times to his friend Broom and began a campaign to ridicule the new university. It reminded readers of its founder's recent involvement in establishing mechanic mechanics institutions and suggested that the new university was intended for the same clientele. It also carried broad, exaggerated warnings about the potential threat to church and state of a non-Anglican university. For good measure, it hinted, despite Campbell's remarks designed to forestall such objections, that London was a place of moral danger to young men. 
A short article in John Bull in February 1825 places Campbell, Birkbeck, and Broom in the line of fire, the last of the three having a gift of a name for satirists, both, both verbal and visual. And this is number one on your handout. This is from John Bull, 14th of February 1825. It is understood that this magnificent national establishment will speedily be undertaken under the immediate surveillance of a learned and liberal committee. Its objects are evidently of first-rate importance and its end will be most salutary. For instance, it is proposed to instruct butchers in geometry and tallow chandlers in Hebrew. Tailors are to, be, are to be perfected in Oriental literature and shoemakers finished up in mathematics. Servants out of livery are to be made good Grecians, while lackeys are only to learn Latin. Campbell Fellowships, so-called after the great founder, are to be created for the benefit of dustmen and chimney sweepers, and a broom exhibition appropriated annually to erudite housemaids. To Dr. Birkbeck, the nation is already indebted for a great work of enlightenment. That's the uh, mechanics institutions. Journeymen carpenters and tailors and bricklayers and plasterers, now dignified into operative artisans, listen with wonder and advantage to the lecturing of popular professors. So you see, this is John Bull pretending to assume that the people who are going to be studying at this new university are um, laborers and artisans. This article finishes with a prospectus invented by John Bull, asserting that the new university will be built in Tothill Fields, a notorious slum near Westminster Abbey, and that pub owners and prostitutes will make a killing. And this is number two on the handout. The morality of London, its quietude and salubrity, appear to combine to render the capital the most convenient place for the education of youth. It is therefore intended to erect a spacious college with proper residences and offices for the reception of the metropolitan and suburban youth in Tothill Fields. And in order to meet any objections which heads of families may make to the perilous exposure of their sons to the casualties arising from crowded streets, a large body of plain, respectable females of the middle age will be engaged to attend students to and from the college in the mornings and evenings of each day. Well, attacks and squibs of this kind became commonplace as the new university slowly became a reality. Traditionalists feared the changes which reform agitation inside and outside Parliament sought. The removal of Catholic disabilities, which passed into law in 1829, and which many bishops viewed as putting the Church of England in danger. The Church in danger was one of those mantras that went round at this time. And the, enfranch the enfranchisement of a proportion of working men, which came about through the Reform Act of 1832. The fear of a working class revolution on the French model was also prevalent. A new university intended to open opportunities to hitherto marginalized groups might encourage social unrest. Campbell and his colleagues were aware of the prejudices which would greet their project, hence the cautious statement of their aims in Campbell's letter to the Times. Campbell was a man of some fame as a writer, and though his reputation was in decline, he was a well-known and well-connected London literary figure when he proposed the idea for the university. He was editor of the New Monthly Magazine, and he was still residually celebrated for his youthful poem, The Pleasures of Hope, published in 1799, in which he had expressed in eminently forgettable verse his sympathy with the anti-slavery movement. So he was properly radical and liberal, and much more useful to the cause of reform than his versifying was Campbell's experience as a Scot who had graduated at the University of Glasgow and saw a partial model uh, in the Scottish system. Four long-established universities, Edinburgh, Glasgow, St Andrews and Aberdeen, flourished in Scotland with a proud tradition of lecturing to young men who usually lived at home, as distinct from the college tutorial system that prevailed at Oxford and Cambridge. In the Scottish universities, there was no religious requirement in order to graduate. Several of the founders of the new Metropolitan University had studied at a Scottish university. In fact, this place was stuffed with Scots in its first years stuffed with them. You can't imagine um, any meeting that took place, particularly in the medical faculty here um, in the late 1820s and early 1830s, must have sounded as if it was taking place in Edinburgh, not in London at all. Anyway, full of Scots. And um, several of the founders were Scots. Either, um, they'd been, either they'd been educated at a Scottish university because they were Scots, or because they were Englishmen who did not subscribe to Anglicanism. 
Broom, for example, was born and educated in Edinburgh, while Birkbeck was the son of a Quaker merchant from Yorkshire. So he too, barred from Oxford and Cambridge, went to study at Edinburgh. Campbell also brought to the new venture a knowledge of the German educational system, having visited Bonn in 1820 and been struck by the tolerance of all religions at the recently established university there. In September 1825, with the new London University plan going ahead, Campbell went on a fact-finding visit, visit to Berlin, where he attended lectures and spoke with professors, coming away impressed by the encouragement given to universities in Prussia, a country where the roads were still sandy tracks, the carriages were bone-shaking, and the streets of Berlin were as yet unpaved, but where the universities were havens of philosophical scholarship. Campbell's contacts in America, meanwhile, uh, where his father had had trade connections and his brother was living in Virginia, also came in handy because it meant that he could bring forward the example of the new University of Virginia, founded by Thomas Jefferson in 1819, with the intention of educating American youth, not only in the traditional subjects, but also in medicine, modern languages, law, politics, and economics. Having helped to set things in motion, Campbell soon faded from the scene. His domestic circumstances were difficult. He had a mentally unstable son and a wife who was sick and who died in 1828. His election to the rectorship of Glasgow University in 1826 meant that his energies and interests were divided, and he missed the ceremony and dinner at the laying of the foundation stone of London University in Gower Street on the 30th of April 1827 because he was in Glasgow fulfilling his duties there. He resigned from the Gower Street Council on grounds of ill health a few months before the university opened to students in 1828. With that, Campbell's contribution ended, and in due course his name was all but erased from the record, while his first collaborator, the phenomenon that was Henry Broom, became the chief figure, adept alike at self-promotion and promotion of the interests of the university, of which he was the first president from its opening until his death 40 years later in 1868, aged 89. During his long life, Henry Broom was one of the most talked about, written about, and caricatured people of the age. Uh, in the politically fraught 1820s, I looked into this and it seemed to me that only George IV himself and the Duke of Wellington were more often subjects of caricature and cartoon than Broom. And Broom, given his name, you can see how it was spelt, but it was pronounced Broom, was represented, of course, either as a Broom, because he was very tall and thin, or as a lawyer, as he was, with wig and gown, brandishing a Broom, showing that he was undertaking to sweep the Augean stables of the legal system as it was uh, with his brandishing his broom. So you constantly see him as a broom or brandishing one. And hence, of course, the joke in John Bull about erudite housemaids um, and their broom scholarships. When the satirical magazine Punch was launched in 1841, most of Broom's achievements were already in the past, but he was still a major, if controversial, figure a fact reflected in his appearance in almost every number of punch during the 1840s and 50s. His accomplishments as a lawyer, journalist, and Whig politician took the breath away. In Parliament, he agitated in opposition during the 1820s for reform of the law and of the voting system. He argued in favor of extending education, against slavery, for Catholic rights, and helped his own Whig government bring in the Great Reform Act of 1832 <coughs> after a decade of debating. Alongside these legal and parliamentary activities, Broom helped Birkbeck to found the London Mechanic Mechanics Institution and also the Infant School Society. He was the chief founder of the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge and wrote many of its pamphlets. And he became the prime mover of the new university. All this time, <laughs> While he was going off on the law circuit and doing all these things, he was also writing copious articles for the Edinburgh Review, which he had helped to found, and the Times, not to mention dealing with sexual blackmail from the notorious courtesan Harriet Wilson, to whom he gave legal advice when she was taken to court for libel after publishing her memoirs in 1825. She famously blackmailed several prominent men, including the Duke of Wellington, who's famously supposed to have replied to her threats with, publish and be damned. Well, Broom helped her 
but by having an affair with her himself, he fell victim to her threats to tell his wife and the world of his faults of adultery and other follies, as she wrote. In the History of University College, a speech given in 1897 by the Professor of Medical Jurisprudence, George Vivian Poor, the early days of the institution were surveyed and Broome's, con Broome's contribution described, and this is number three on your handout. This is describing Broom. His mind was like a dry sponge. It soaked up everything in the shape of knowledge it came across. And before he was 13, he'd learned everything they could teach him at the high school at Edinburgh. He learned languages, science, philosophy, and everything else without the least trouble. Lord Broom was a man of enormous industry and was connected with the foundation of the Edinburgh Review. And to show you what his mind was, it may be stated that he wrote nearly the whole of one number of the Edinburgh Review and that his articles ranged of a great variety of subjects from Chinese music to the operation of lithotomy. His vers versatility was astounding and it is recorded that Samuel Rogers, the poet, when he saw Lord Broom driving off from Panshanger, it was Lord Cooper's country house, said, there goes Solomon, Lysurgus, Demosthenes, Archimedes, Sir Isaac Newton, Lord Chesterfield, and a great many other persons in one post-chaise. Well, this phenomenon, Broom, presided from the first uh, at the University of London over a heterogeneous and sometimes ideologically split group, consisting of radicals, Whigs, utilitarian disciples of Jeremy Bentham, Catholics, Jews, and dissenting Protestants. And he did it in the main brilliantly. Most of the meetings were held at his chambers in Lincoln's Inn. He regularly fed reports of these to the press, particularly the Times. He also published long articles in praise of the new university in the Edinburgh Review, as did the Review's rising star, Thomas Babington Macaulay, who predicted, you'll like this, I think, in February 1826, that the infant institution was destined to a long, a glorious, and a beneficent existence, and that it would be the model of many future establishments. Macaulay's father, Zachary Macaulay, was one of the founders of uh, the university. Now, the group now turned in earnest to the matter of raining, raising money. The plan was to amass at least £150,000, and the hope was that they would find enough good men and true, in Broom's words, to take shares. Broom was famously depicted selling shares as early as July 1825 by Robert Cruikshank. It's number four on your handout. You probably recognize it. Robert Cruikshank was the brother of the more famous caricaturist George Cruikshank. This cartoon, called The Political Toy Man, shows Broom in his lawyer's wig and gown walking round Lincoln's Inn with a model of the London College on his head, a book at his waist entitled List of Shareholders, and a money bag over his arm inscribed subscriptions. It was, you see, thought to be infra dig to set about uh, founding a new serious uh, learned institution by selling shares. Three of the most wealthy founders of the new university, including the financier and campaigner for Jewish rights, Isaac Lyon Goldsmith, were directly responsible for the new university finding its location not in Tothill Fields, but in Bloomsbury. In 1824, a banker named Bevan had bought a site of nearly eight acres of undeveloped wasteland on the Mortimer Estate at the top end of Gower Street. Maps of the time show a projected square, uh, which was going to be built on the site, Carmarthen Square, but this was never built, as the three university founders bought the land from Bevan for £30,000 and held it until enough money was raised to start building. When William Wilkins's neoclassical design was chosen, the die was cast for a building and a purpose, which was to help define the character of the area, Bloomsbury, from that moment until the present day. Bloomsbury would from now on be associated primarily with education and culture, while visually it was represented quite frequently by elegant classical, and some said, thinking of the godless college on Gower Street, pagan architecture. And if you wanted to look at the Bloomsbury project, you'll find that um, my colleagues and I have identified over 300 ed educational or cultural reforming institutions which were set up in Bloomsbury uh, during the 19th century, many of them closely related or you are by the same personnel as the people who started University College London. Wilkins designed a long building facing Gower Street with a 10-column Corinthian portico in the middle, topped by a dome, and two side wings with smaller domes in the angles between the long building and the wings. 
When submitting his design, Wilkins stressed its grandeur and unusualness, features which were no doubt attractive to the founders. And this is number five on the handout. This is Wilkins's description of his design. There is no example in England of a portico with 10 columns in front. It is for this reason that I've chosen as my prototype the magnificent portico of the Olympium at Athens, the proportions of which I have closely followed. The Times, the Friendly Times, reported in August 1828 that the building was nearing completion, with scaffolding due to come down before the opening of the college in two months' time, when, number six on the handout, as the Times says, the public will have an uninterrupted view of a handsome and commodious structure, no gaudy affectation of ornament or incongruous embellishment, defects which disfigure so many of the public buildings of the metropolis, but a chaste and truly classic specimen of Grecian architecture. Well, in the event, there wasn't enough money to complete Wilkins's elegant plan, and the two wings were not built until the 1870s. And if you look at the picture at the head of the handout, you see that is a, a drawing of University College or the University of London as it was when it opened in 1828. You see it did not have the wings at that time because money ran out. But even in its unfinished state, the new building was imposing. However, the fact that it was on wasteland, where rubbish was dumped and dirty puddles abounded, was too delightful a gift for opponents to ignore. John Bull found a number of ways to insult the new university as in some way disreputable. The paper was edited and, in fact, entirely written um, by Theodore Hook, a Bloomsbury-born prankster and man about town who had perpetrated the famous Berners Street hoax in 1809 at the age of 20. On that occasion, you might have heard of the Ber Berners Street hoax, He's, <laughs> he targeted a Mrs. Tottenham, ordering a huge number of goods to be sent to her Berners Street home. Wagon loads of coal, pianos, organs, jewelry, and pieces of furniture of every description. At the same time, as he had bidden the Lord Mayor of London, the Governor of the Bank of England, the Chairman of the East India Company, and other notables to visit her. And he and a friend sat at the window of a neighboring house and watched the mayhem that uh, occurred in Berners Street that day with all these people and all these things turning up to poor Mrs. Tottenham. Well, when in 1825, Hook, as the editor of, the, of John Bull, started writing about the plans for the new university, he had only recently left debtor's prison after losing 12,000 pounds of government money while he had occupied the post of accountant and treasurer in Mauritius. In July 1825, his article entitled Joint Stock Cockney Learning Company, capital 300,000 pounds, appeared in John Bull. Here, he pretended to be horrified at the supposed political and religious subversiveness of the new institution and cleverly coupled this attack with the mania at the time for the floating of companies dealing in insurance, gas, mining, canals, and of course the new steam technology. The implication was that there was something dodgy about selling shares in the university and that the risk of collapse was great. Even more of a gift than this share selling was the foul-smelling sight. In December 1825, a comic poem called Stinker Malee was printed in John Bull. To be sung, apparently, to the tune of Derry Down, it began, and this is number seven on your handout, the fiat is issued, says reason to fame. My college in Gower Street at length has a name. Go trumpet it forth, both by land and by sea. My college is christened, ma'am, Stinker Malee. Later in the poem, Hook has Joseph Hume congratulating his fellow founder, Broom. Number eight. The choice of its site, says Hume, properly falls to cultivate strong common sense in its halls. For whoever will come will find, my dear B, very strong common sense in your stinkamalee. Well, on went John Bull with this fun. Another poem, Stinkamalee Triumphans, greeted the soon-to-be-opened university in April 1828. And in May, there was an article describing Broom and his colleagues as shareholders in the joint stock dirt and learning company of Stinkamalee. The nickname Stinkamalee stuck for a time, as did others started by John Bull, such as Cockney College or Cockney University, which also appeared in the titles of cartoons, like William Heath's number nine on your handout. This
This was an engraving published in February 1826, showing Broom on the right-hand side hammering on an anvil inscribed public support with a red-hot iron bar named philosophy. And you'll see on the left-hand side various rough-looking individuals saying, Phil forever, Sophie for me. Uh, this, is, this is their take on the philosophy that they're going to learn. The most imaginative poem attacking the university was that by Winfred, Winthrop Mackworth Praed, a young Tory and old Etonian, born in 1802 in Bedford Row, Bloomsbury. His discourse, delivered by a college tutor at a supper party, imagines the response by an Oxbridge don to the news of a new rival being founded. Having urged his colleagues to make opposition to the radical infidel college, the dawn continues with an awful warning of social revolution, and it's number 10. It is a terrible crisis for Cam and for Isis. Fat butchers are learning dissection, and looking glass makers become Sabbath breakers to study the rules of reflection. One more young Tory, a future political star, the young Bloomsbury resident Benjamin Disraeli also had fun with the planned university in his debut novel, Vivian Gray, the first part of which was published in April 1826. Disraeli had been born in 1804, just off Bedford Row. His father, the antiquarian scholar Isaac Disraeli, moved the family to Bloomsbury Square in 1817 to be even nearer the British Museum for his studies. And being a non-observant Jew with ambitions for his son, attended church at St George's Bloomsbury, where Benjamin was baptised. Benjamin did not go to university. He spent some time as a solicitor's clerk and entered Lincoln's Inn, but he refused a legal career, preferring to write as a journalist and novelist. Now, though a Tory, a young Tory, Disraeli aimed his satire in the anonymously published Vivian Gray, not just at real-life radicals, but also at dyed-in-the-wool Tories. This is 1826, and it's the last on your handout. One of these dyed-in-the-wool Tories, given the name Sir Christopher Mowbray in the novel, is a county member of Parliament in his 79th year, but still able to follow a fox, though he has no idea of liberal principles or anything else of that school. This really mocks Sir Christopher's horror at the idea of a modern university in London. This is number 11. The only thing which he does not exactly comprehend is the London University. This affair really puzzles the worthy gentleman who could as easily fancy a county member not being a freeholder as a university not being at Oxford or Cambridge. Indeed, to this hour, the old gentleman believes that the whole business is a damnational hoax. And if you tell him that there's little apprehension that in the course of a century, the wooden poles which are now stuck about the ground will not be as fair and flourishing as the most leafy bowers of new college gardens, the old gentleman looks up to heaven as if determined not to be taken in, and leaning back in his chair, sends forth a sceptical and smiling, no, 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 that won't do. Well, against virulent opposition from the real Sir Christopher Mowbrays, compounded by lack of funds and some poor decision-making early in the early days, the new university did eventually and emphatically do. Though it took several decades of dogged determination on the part of its supporters and employees, the university eventually fulfilled uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay's apparently outlandish prophecy that it would set the standard for the universities of the future. Um, thank you very much for this uh, very spirited and uh, entertaining uh, glimpse into UCL's past and all that it has endured. Uh, um, we have a, a four minutes left for questions, but it is only four minutes, so I would encourage you not to sit on your questions, but to ask them. Yes. Sorry. Is there documentation going on about the processes, the political processes happening at UCL at the moment. It seems very ironic that this has started as such a, a liberal, radical institution and where it stands now in its relationship to, I don't know, student fees, As, et as you can imagine, I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a shame. <laughs> Um, I just wonder um, what Bull would have said if he'd known about the bones which were discovered at the front of University College and uh, 
if if you know anything more about well i think there's going to be an exhibition but um oh, the, the the bones which were recently found under the the, the front quad yeah i think they were they were thought to be human but they're now thought to be animal bones i think are they not i'm i'm not sure i did um my son's doing archaeology here and i did a classics archaeology masters recently after i you know, I'd had a life being a barrister, having done a law degree here and came back to do that. And I understand there are some human bones, um, and they're very, very old. But Well, there might be. I mean, I can't go into it, but there, John Bull and other um, uh, attackers of what was going on here were very keen to suggest that um, bodies were being um, robbed from gra you know, graves and so on here by medical students and, and professors mm -hmm. before the passing of the Anatomy Act in 1832, which allowed for dissection of bodies. Before that, it was illegal. Um, it went on. It went on in Edinburgh all the time, as we know, with the Burke and Hare scandal of 1829. But, it, 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 but, but John Bull wanted to suggest that it was also going on here under the, under the, the, in, the, in the basement of university. College. Um, that's very interesting because when I did my law degree here in 1975, um, there were only six female law students in my year, and we had our law, many of our law lectures in the anatomy theatre. And the young male medical students used to throw bones at us, so there was a lot less security of bones than now th then okay, than well there that, is now. That, that's Thank very you for that. The gentleman next to you had a question. Would you just pass the? No. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, um, Gresham College was founded, what, 230 years earlier? Um, oh, sorry, what was? Gresham College. Gresham, yes, Gresham. And I wondered what the relationship was between it and the founders of UCL back in the 1820s. None. None that I've come across. There may, uh, if anybody knows of any, I'd be happy to know them, but none that I have come across. Uh, all the people here that I can see were um, intent on really introducing the Scottish system, actually, mainly. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, there wasn't... There was a recognition that there had been higher education uh, for, for a longer period in Gresham College, but it, there was no direct connection, not that I know of, anyway. 